Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. After a highly acclaimed webinar series on time to tame typhoid, we are back again with another educational three-part webinar series on advancing diagnostics evolution in hematopathology. This is being brought to you by Unipat Specialty Laboratory and Vanguard Diagnostics, an R&D and manufacturing company in the in vitro diagnostic space. My name is Veena Kohli. I'm the CEO and founder of Vanguard Diagnostics, and it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome each one of you to the first edition of this very special webinar series on unraveling the progress in diagnostic and therapeutic hematology. The session will be moderated by none other than Dr. Ravi Gaur. Dr. Gaur is the chairman of the Medical Advisory Committee at Unipath Speciality Laboratory, and he's also the founder of DRG Laboratory. Dr. Gaur brings with him over 30 years of experience in pathology, immunology, molecular biology, and genomics, and he's a renowned oncopathologist. He has tremendous passion towards steering the course of diagnostics towards personalized medicine and advanced technologies. Ladies and gentlemen, we are truly privileged and fortunate today to have this golden opportunity of learning the basics and advancements in hematology from the guru himself, Dr. Tejender Singh. Dr. Singh brings with him over 40 years of diagnostic experience and wisdom. As we are all aware, books authored by Dr. Singh have shaped the curriculum of medical education in India. So stay tuned as our experts share their insights on the vital subject of diagnostic and therapeutic hematology. So it's over to you, Dr. Gaur. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, the new series of uh, evolution and uh, hematopathology. And uh, brought to you by like Unipath Specialty Laboratories and of course Vanguard Diagnostics. I think uh, it's always a pleasure to have uh, you know I look back what what we started and where we reached, and probably that gives us a really lot of wisdom. Uh, where we started and where have we reached, what are the defaults and challenges, how are we going to take it forward. I think it's my pleasure and it's, I think, uh, my honor rather to have uh, you know, been a, you know, our esteemed uh, you know, panel speaker, Sir Dr. Pindar Singh, sir. Welcome, sir. I think uh, it's my honor and uh, to introduce you, but in fact, we don't need to reintroduce you. Anybody, everybody, you just say, when it comes to hematology, it's like synonymous with you. I think we have all been uh, blessed by your wisdom, knowledge. We have read your books and we probably all are eager to hear uh, today. Thank you so much for being here. And of course, thank you, Meenaji, to get uh, the, the things together. Uh, I think, uh, look, let's start. I think what I'd like to just say, because this is a three-part webinar series. And today we are talking about the first part. Uh, the first part will talk about unraveling the progress in diagnostics and therapeutic hematopathology. Uh, there are the two parts. One is the peripheral blood and then of course coagulation and quality. I think we will probably get to know as and when we announce those second. This is a good series. Now, if you look at the you know ever-evolving hematopathology, this hematopathology is basically all you know is a branch of pathology dedicated to the study of blood-related disorders. It has undergone a remarkable journey of the past century. And as compared to pathology, hematopathology is a literally young subspeciality. Hematopathologists did not have their identity until, I think, somewhere in the records in 1974. The first organization dedicated to hematopathology that the European Lymphoma Club was formed, and Karl Langer organized his first meeting in Kiel, Germany. Since that time, they have evolved a lot. It's a story of human curiosity and innovation, from stains to sequences, from microscopes to machine learning, and each chapter enriching our understanding of blood-related disorders. It's a century-long voyage from cell identification to genomic exploration, a journey that underscores the importance of interdisciplinary collaboration in decoding the intricate language of blood disorders. Following the first case of Hodgkin's lymphoma described by Thomas Hodgkin in 1832, the field of hematopathology had traversed a lot, with the efforts of generations of outstanding hematopathologists, and I think we have served with us, it's, uh, each subsequent era has advanced the field further. Probably 
many of the chapters are actually written by Sir Himshel of the Singh, right here in the Thank you, Sir, again for being here. Uh, nowadays, histopathology, even pathology has become a discipline that studies the disease of lymphoid tissue, spleen, blood, and bone marrow. But historically, now, if the growth has experienced four eras, whatever I could understand, probably that is the morphological era, then the immunological era, genetic era, and the molecular era. The application of microscope and pathology, indeed, for the golden age of this era, that was the morphological era. Then came the immunological era. You know, this is where I think the gray zone lymphomas were recognized by overlapping immunological features, immunosuristic mystery, and various common lymphoid malignancy antibody. Then came the genetic era. The cause of leukemia and lymphoma had long been puzzled by hematopathologists. But somewhere in 1960, the Peter Novel and David Hunger had, uh, jointly shows that cancer arose uh, because of one cell with the chromosome abnormally divided into many, and that small chromosome was called the Lulfia chromosome. And up to date, hundreds of cytological abnormalities have been identified in hematopoietic and lymphoid neoplasm. And of course, then came this 2000, that's a molecular era. It only not created a new millennium, but also opened a new chapter for hematopathology. Now, with the constantly advancing science and technology, it's very difficult to keep pace with us. But I think it's very important to keep in touch with it. This is something we are evolving and journey is being very, very fast paced. We're doing a very higher and higher level. So I think this is the that's the first thing we need to understand. That's where we have Sir with us. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Tender Singh, Sir. So please, the stage is set for you. And we all look forward to hear from you. Over to you, Sir, for the next six sessions. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you, Dr. Veena. Thank you, Dr. Gaur. Uh, it is uh, my privilege to be here at the inaugural uh, session for the series of lectures which are being organized by both of you. And you have rightly pointed out that we are now in a molecular era. And most of the diseases are being identified at a molecular level. And as and when we identify a disease, the etiopathogenesis on the basis of molecules, we are able to find a treatment as well because we know something is going wrong in the molecules and then how to mend that so then it is possible. So I start my <clears throat> talk and start sharing my screen. And what I'm going to talk about is diagnostic and therapeutic hematology and what have been the advances in last uh, uh, 50 years. As Dr. Ragor pointed out that uh, it is a comparatively uh, new branch of medicine and uh, therefore we come across whatever is happening in hematology the things are <clears throat> rather new and uh, basically what we find is that uh, hematology is a disease of uh, clinical as well as the diagnostic part and the two are intertwined with each other. See, a disease is seen by a clinical person, here what we call as clinical hematologist, and then he refers the case to a pathologist. Now, pathologist examines the blood, smears, the machine thing, which now give us cell counters, and then finally may go on to the bone marrow aspiration, biopsy, then we go on to uh, chromosomal, and finally, we go on to the molecular. So basically, a clinical hematologist is dependent on a pathologist for a final diagnosis. And then only the treatment is started. In UK, we find the clinical hematologist also looks at the peripheral smear and the bone marrow. So the two roles are combined. However, in USA and in India, we find that the clinical hematologists are clinical people 
and they have done either MD in medicine or pediatrics. And then you find that those who are pathologists, they look at the smears, they look at the <clears throat> various reports of genes and chromosomes and mutations, and then they integrate. Now the role of an integration has become very, very important so that all the molecular genetic reports are integrated by one person. And that the best person suited for this job is none other than a uh, hematopathologist. Now, if we go on to the history of uh, hematology, what we find is that it was the Leuven Hoek who was the first person who discovered the microscopes and later on he discovered the red cells. And then we found that the Hewsons described different types of cells. And that is where the entire discipline of hematology has been built upon the various types of cells we, which we come across in the blood. Wir Barkov, we find that he is called the father of cellular pathology because he explained all the white cells and at the same time he explained what is pulmonary thromboembolism and that is where we find that now we have the Barkov's triad which we remember always whenever we teach the undergraduates. Now the subspeciality of hematology actually began with Max Ventrop and he characterized the various types of cells. And he was the first one to characterize the various anemias as well. He described normocytic, microcytic, macrocytic anemias based on the size of the red cells. And that improved our understanding of the physiology, rather the pathophysiology of the disease process of these cells. To be brief, the blood cell staining was developed by Ehrlichs and he identified three types of white cells with purple granules, blue granules and red granules. However, right optimized the various stains and that is why we have the stains with the name of right stain and then we have the Ginza stain. And then it was a Wintrobe who <clears throat> quantified the red cells and then classified various types of anemias. This is a picture of Professor Maxwell Wintrop, who did his uh, medicine at uh, Canada. But later on, he was asked to write a section on diseases of the blood. And from that day onwards, since his boss was editor of the practice of medicine, and that is the time he became a hematologist. And then he has written various books on uh, hematology. Another thing which he did was the hematocrit or the packed cell volume, what we earlier used to call it as PCV. And uh, that is by his tube. And we still name it as Wintrop tube in which we pack the red cells and then see the volume of those cells. It should be more than 45% or around about 45%. And then he laid the foundation for microcytic, normocytic, and macrocytic anemias. What I'm going to talk about is advances in therapy because hematology, as I told you, is made up of two parts, clinical hematology and hematopathology. So first I'll take up advances in therapy and then advances in the lab technology. I'll start with a case. I'm sharing a case which is an old one a Miss P, 20-year-old girl, was admitted with fever of one week duration. She had pallor, no organomegaly, low hemoglobin of 8, TLC of 2,000, platelets were reduced to 34,000, patient had pancytopenia and not feeling well, and in between she had fever. She had been given hematinics, but there was no response. And then we examined the peripheral blood, and we found there was an occasional blastoid cell, we did a myeloperoxidase, it turned out to be positive. We carried out the bone marrow aspirate. There were 40% uh, blast cells in the bone marrow. 
So we had a case who had acute myeloid leukemia and it was FAB classified as M2. The clinicians carried out induction. This was a case we encountered at MAMC. She responded very well to induction therapy. She went into remission and at the time of remission, she had only 2% blast cells. She was put on maintenance. Four months later, she became pale. Peripheral blood, no blast cells. She refused for a bone marrow. Macrocytic anemia. And then we started on B12 and poly, but there was hardly any response. And uh, after repeated requests, she agreed for a bone marrow aspirate and we carried out the bone marrow aspirate. And this is what we found on the bone marrow aspirate. It was just full of blasts, which constituted about 95% of the blast cells. Then remission was induced. She was put on maintenance. Again, four months later, she became pale. And uh, there was partial response. And re-induction was carried out. And again, she developed relapse. So it was thrice that she had gone into a disease, which at that point of time had hardly any cure. Some of the patients of AML used to get treated. They would be cured. But by and large, the prognosis for AML was pretty bad, about 30 years back. Now, that was a time when uh, at Tata Cancer Hospital, Bombay, the bone marrow transplantation was carried out. So we contacted there. Dr. Advani was there. He was very nice. And he agreed that what he's going to take is whenever they take the next case and it could be her. So then after about three months, they took three cases. And one of the cases was uh, this particular case. Since she was young, they agreed to take her because they were doing bone marrow transplantation in younger patients only at that point of time. Fortunately, the, her brother's bone marrow matched, so that problem was not there, and therefore bone marrow transplantation was carried out. And she responded very well. Platelets, neutrophils, hemoglobin, everything started improving, and she appeared okay after three months. But then she started developing features of uh, GVHD, that is a graft versus host disease. Sclerosis of the skin started, especially on hands and face. She had dysphagia, indicating that probably uh, there could be esophageal strictures or it was a process of edema of the esophagus. She was a brilliant girl. She completed her graduation in a Delhi University College and she joined Masters. So next one year, her face changed from a pretty girl. We found that it, her face had become mask-like face because of uh, GVHD. Unfortunately, she again went into a relapse. And this time, the peripheral blood also showed large number of blast cells. She refused to do uh, any, uh, she, any treatment. She says that it has been enough and uh, she refused any treatment. So she didn't uh, live long enough, but we learned a lot from uh, her uh, disease. And uh, <clears throat> I wish at that point of time, the bone marrow transplantation, which had just started, had been uh, say, uh, very well organized, and then probably we could have saved. But of course, it all depends on various factors on the disease process itself, we could not get any molecular thing at that point of time. However, the uh, professor Donald Thomas, who had carried out the first uh, hematopoietic cell uh, transplant, he was awarded uh, or honored with Nobel Prize in uh, 1990. Now, at that point of time, it was an allogenic uh, bone marrow transplant. And over the years, uh, allogenic bone marrow transplants were carried out. And usually these were carried out in HLA matched cases only. And the results, in spite of being HLA matched, were not uh, very good because uh, only about 50% of the survivors 
they developed acute versus and chronic graft versus post disease as well. However, we found that in acute leukemias and even in some chronic diseases also, bone marrow transplantation is still being carried out. However, now we find that the bone marrow transplantation for aplastic anemias and hemoglobinopathies is very, very successful, especially if it is, uh, it is a HLA matched. But now what we are doing is it is a haploid matching. That means only half the uh, HLA, A, B, C, D are matching. Only the, even with that, we find the prognosis is very good. And for hemoglobinopathies, it is as good as 90%. There was a time when for getting the bone marrow transplantation done, we had to register. And after registration, it would take a few months or sometimes even years for uh, BMT to be carried out. Now, this innovation which started with Professor Donald, we find now that uh, haploid uh, identical marrows are good enough for benign diseases. That is for thalassemia, sickle cell disease, and various other hemoglobinopathies. Second case I would like is a H, 25 years male. Uh, he had a mass 12 into 9 into 15 centimeter, and that mass was in the knee joint. Now that was excised. And we received two sections for opinion. Now, every year we have four meetings of a daily chapter of IAPM. And in those, we all the institutions of Delhi, they discuss some difficult cases. And this case was given as a difficult case. And uh, everybody gave their opinion. And the majority of the opinion was that it was a hemangioendothelioma, uh, malignant hemangioendothelioma, low grade. So that patient, we were told in the next meeting that it was not a case of uh, hemangioendothelioma, rather it was a case of a granulation tissue. And whatever we found in that big mass was actually the granulation tissue. However, there was a tremendous endothelial fibroblastic proliferation and it appeared like as if it is a case of hemangioendothelioma. And then they had carried out various tests on that and it was found that he was a case of hemophilia. Now, he, the patient was not even aware of the fact that he had uh, hemophilia. He was not aware of any treatment. He had not taken any treatment. It was just an injury and uh, gradually the knee is swollen. up. So now we know that hemophilia is a disease of uh, factor 8 deficiency and as and when we find that the factor 8 is less than 1% of the normal amount, we find that uh, small injury can lead to big hematomas in the knee, around the ankle, around these big joints. Now, what is the treatment? At that point of time, the patient was not aware of the treatment also, that uh, because he was not aware of the fact that he's suffering from uh, hemophilia. So at that time, it was fresh frozen plasma. So what they used to do was that fresh frozen plasma from many donors was collected, and then it was allowed it to thaw in cold, and what we called it as cryoprecipitated plasma or cryoprecipitate. So at that point of time, the treatment was cryoprecipitate. And then the work started that if factor eight could be, uh, could be manufactured and then the recombinant technology came and that recombinant technology helped us. And that is, I think around about 1990, that uh, recombinant technology was there. And with that technology, recombinant factor eight, recombinant factor nine were made. Another problem had occurred in 80s was that the hepatitis and HIV threatened the worldwide blood supply. Because whenever a transfusion was given to a patient, 
those who were suffering from hepatitis or from HIV, there was a widespread disease. And those who were receiving blood or blood products like thalassemics or hemophiliacs, they were getting the disease for no fault of theirs. So at that point of time, the various technologies were applied, dry heat, solvent detergent treatment, pasteurization, and then the screening test also started for uh, HIV as well as for hepatitis B. And it was in 1990 that recombinant factor eight was approved by FDA. And during those uh, two or three years, the busiest man probably was Professor Manucci from Italy. He is a respected authority on hemostasis and thrombosis, and he has worked tremendously in cases of hemophilia and on von Willebrand disease. He has won uh, various awards, and he has been honored all over the country, all over the world rather. And he came to India, and uh, <clears throat> he had a week long uh, stay in India. He visited various centers all over the country and Dr. Uh, Manorama Bhargav from Ames, and then later on Dr. Renu Saxena. They have also worked tremendously on uh, coagulation, on, uh, on platelet disorders, and they brought an awareness of hemophilia all over the country. And uh, various conferences and workshops were held for hemophilia and various other coagulation disorders. Then recombinant factor eight was licensed and now it is available to the hemophilia patients. With the, Dr. Manucci's initiative and Dr. Manorama Bhargav's uh, initiative, what we found was that Hemophedra Hemophilia Federation of India was formed. And now we have um, branches of uh, Hemophilia Federation all over the country. And the best part is, that these federations are having deep freeze. They are keeping the recombinant factor eight. We have made registries of hemophilic patients so that these hemophilic patients, as soon as the injury occurs, now they've been made aware of it. And now recently, Indian College of Hematology has started again making people aware of the fact that uh, factor 8, recombinant factor 8, and other factors are also available for these patients with coagulation disorders. Recently, we came across an article by Professor Manucci that is Hemophilia Treatment Innovation, 50 years of progress, what has already come, and then he writes, there is still more to come, and probably all these factors which are expensive will become cheaper. However, in India, we find that it is being given almost free of cost to patients of uh, hemophilia. Then I go on to another case, uh, case number three, Miss V, 26-year-old lady. She was an OPD patient, had hepatosplenomegaly, and you can see the blood picture. It is just showing myeloid cells, blast, promyelo, myelo, meta, and we know it is a picture highly suggestive of chronic myeloid leukemia. Now, in uh, 80s and 90s, NAP score was the criterion. NAP score, if it is low, it was highly suggestive that we are dealing with a case of uh, chronic myeloid leukemia. She took very regularly myeloran. She used to come to our hematology clinic at MEMC, and later on, it was switched on to hydroxyurea. After three years of treatment, and she was doing it very well, she came to the hematology clinic and she says, uh, I want to get married. So we explained to her the problems and uh, how it is going to affect. And then she says that not only she wants to get married, but uh, she also wants to have a child. Again, all those things, whatever was available in the literature, we told her, but she was adamant. And in the next uh, clinic, she came with the boy with whom she wanted to marry. And we explained to him that uh, this is a state of affairs and how CML behaves and gave him some literature also. But then after two months, 
they landed up and they said that we have married. So she got married and then she got pregnant after about six months. And uh, then we had, before she got, uh, soon after her marriage, we had done our bone marrow biopsy also. And this is what it showed. It showed not only myeloid proliferation, but tremendous megakaryocytic proliferation and marrow fibrosis. And we explained that as the fibrosis keeps on increasing, the problems occur. It, she may go into cytopenia or she may go into blast crisis. At that time, this was not labeled as advanced phase of CML. But we now, WHO 2022 says that uh, such cases of granulocytic, megakaryocytic proliferation with fibrosis are actually the cases of advanced phase of CML. Now, during throughout her pregnancy, her counts were monitored every 15 days. Her counts never increased. Her counts remained less than 15,000. We still could not find any literature which may tell us why in pregnancy in CML the counts, why don't the counts increase. However, she delivered a normal baby and uh, they were so happy. However, after about eight months, she developed uh, accelerated phase when the blast cells started increasing and then she went on to develop a blast crisis and uh, she expired. Now, CML became a poster child for targeted cancer therapy because this is one disease where we came to know that it is a reciprocal translocation between chromosomes 9 and 22 and BCR ABL is the molecular uh, mutation which occurs. Now we can detect it by various methods and this was the... <clears throat> response in patients by and large when imatinib came because what had happened was that uh, once we knew that it is a BCR ABL then the treatment was found and the treatment turned out to be a imatinib. You can see that in about 100 to 150 days the counts from lakhs came down to a few thousand and then these were maintained. So it appeared that we have found a magic uh, bullet and that is what came in the Time uh, magazine that now there is a war against cancer is may end and these are the uh, magic bullets which are most, uh, BCR ABL. Actually, the decade of 1990 to 2000 was very, very uh, productive. Uh, in medicine in the sense that uh, drugs like uh, imatinib were, and other drugs were found out. So the era of target therapy started. Now this was the first target therapy and then we had um, now uh, uh, various other antibodies also which were tried because then we started using monoclonal antibodies when we were diagnosing various types of cancer like cytokeratin, like epithelial membrane antigen, carcinoma embryonic antigens, wherever one could find. So there were antibodies which were coming up. But this was the first case of targeted therapy. I wish for Miss V when she had come to us, we had targeted therapy. Uh, she would have been probably living with uh, her child who would have been going to school at this point of time. Now this is the 2016 classification of uh, myeloproliferative neoplasms. The name changed from myeloproliferative diseases to myeloproliferative neoplasm and we classified into two BCR ABL positive and BCR ABL negative. Negative were polycythemia, essential thrombocythemia and primary myelofibrosis. This was a very nice article by Teferi et al. And in which he has studied about 1000 cases of myeloproliferative neoplasms, as you can see. Now you look at it and then you find that BCR ABL was the beginning. Now the second molecular abnormality which was found was JAK2 mutation. And then CalR mutation 
NPL mutation, and then there were others which were triple negative. Now, JAK2 mutation was seen not only in polycythemia vera, it was also seen in cases of essential thrombocythemia, also in cases of uh, primary myelofibrosis. And what was found was that cases which were JAK2 positive, they had worse prognosis. And then there were cases, say about 10% cases, which were negative for all these driver mutations. And those were labeled as uh, triple negative mutations. Now, in triple negative uh, MPNs also, there were other mutations which were present. If those three driver mutations were not there, but ASXL1, TET2, DNMT3A, IDH1, IDH2, one of these mutations was present, which led to the proliferation of the tumor cells. Now, the question arises, why JAK2 cythemia in one group of patients? It leads to essential thrombocythemia in the second one. And the fourth case, you find the patients develop primary myelofibrosis. What is there? Why should it not cause one disease like BCRABL causes only CML? Then it was found that actually it is the allele burden. Low allele burden, good prognosis, ET. Intermediate allele burden, more of homozygous, then it is a case of polycythemia vera. And if it is allele burden is high, and then it is a case of primary myelofibrosis, which has got the worst prognosis. Now, the next targeted therapy, which is been of clinical use, like imatinib. Now, of course, in imatinib, we have got various other weight drugs, like uh, we have desatinib, we have got uh, nilotinib. The second drug which has been of clinical use is anti-CD20 antibody, which is uh, in use. And uh, this is uh, the one which has been, uh, we know that CD20 is on the lymphoid cells. And therefore, we find that this has been come out to be very, very useful in two conditions. One are the B-cell neoplasms and second are the cases of wherever there is overactive B cells of the immune system. That is cases which are autoimmune diseases. It has been found to be very, very useful. Now, how does rituximab or anti-CD20 antibody acts? It acts by four mechanisms. One is that antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Second is complement dependent cytotoxicity. And third one is induction of apoptosis. Now, rituximab is used in uh, B, lymphoproliferative disorders, ruxolitinib in PV, eclizumab in PNH, and then in refractory thrombocytopenia cases. Now, after rituximab, since it is being used in uh, B cell lymphomas, we found that another pathway was uh, tagged along and that was BTK pathway. And then one drug was uh, against BTK pathway came and that was a brutinib. And now we have uh, many drugs or many variants of uh, a brutinib you can see. And they are very, very useful and quite effective in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, in DLBCL, in follicular lymphomas, in mental cell lymphomas, marginal zone lymphomas, and even in Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. So with this target therapy, now we go on to uh, one of our professors at uh, Mansi, who was a physicist, and uh, he was in charge of all the machines and the radiotherapy section. He came to us with weakness. He had no organomegaly, X-rays showed osteoporosis, but then it could have been a old age osteoporosis. Hemoglobin was 10, TLC, DLC normal, ESR was high, ultrasound normal, BMA and biopsy were carried out. It turned out to be a dry tap, but whatever biopsy we got, we made the bone marrow imprint smears. And this is what we saw in the bone marrow imprint smears, a pleomorphic tumor. And then uh, in the evening, he rang me up. He says, what is there in the imprint smears? 
So we told him it appears to be a case of metastatic carcinoma. We can't say which one it is because the cells are very, very pleomorphic. Two days later, we got this biopsy and biopsy also showed a very, very pleomorphic tumor. Couldn't make out whether it is carcinoma, sarcoma or any other thing. But we told that it appears to be a case of metastatic carcinoma. Now, that is the time when we were uh, playing with these monoclonal antibodies. And uh, then we found out that uh, we tried CD20 negative, CD3 negative, and EMA CK were negative. CD138 we tried because in the imprint smear there are few plasma cells. And look, it turned out to be positive. It is a CD138 positive. So then we came to know that this is a case of uh, multiple myeloma. And then we carried out kappa and lambda. Kappa was negative, but the lambda was positive. All plasma cells, all pleomorphic plasma cells were positive. So this was a case of multiple myeloma with marrow fibrosis. And for anemia, we knew that since it is a multiple myeloma induced uh, anemia, which is more of a anemia of chronic malignancy or chronic disease, he was put on recombinant human erythropoietin. Now, what, why I showed this case is that there were uh, two or three things in uh, multiple myeloma. Number one, whenever there is a dry tap, like this particular patient had dry tap, biopsy is very, very useful. And then on biopsy, you can cut multiple sections. You can do immunohistochemistry is the second thing. And third is recombinant technology was there. And now the recombinant human erythropoietin was uh, in the market. Now this EPO is being given since that time to almost all patients of chronic renal failure because these chronic renal failure patients do not respond since there is a damage to the cells, interlaces cells, and therefore there is no secretion of EPO and therefore EPO is very, very useful in these cases. And now immunohistochemistry has become advanced, very uh, good monoclonal antibodies, which are very, very specific and sensitive are now available. Now we have uh, antibodies, which not only uh, tell us about the malignancy, the various types, the various types of lymphomas, but even the molecular ones are available. And those are against PML RARA and BRAF mutation, which is positive in uh, Hairy cell leukemia, BCR, ABL also now we have the monoclonal antibody. And recombinant human erythropoietin, and of course, you are aware of its tremendous use. Another thing in uh, multiple myeloma is there is a tremendous uh, contribution by Professor Kyd. And now we have uh, Dr. Shaji Kumar. See, in America, they call uh, the Indian Mafia in two diseases where the Indians have a big hold. One is multiple myeloma and second one is chronic lymphocytic leukemia. In multiple myeloma, we have Professor Shaji Kumar. Then we have Professor Vincent Rajkumar. Both of them are in uh, Mayo Clinic. And uh, Nupur Rajesh, she is in, I think, W. D. Anderson Cancer Center. So the Indians have sort of dominated the uh, picture a good faculty of Indians is available uh, in uh, who are treating large number of cases of multiple myeloma and their research papers are very well uh, recognized and whatever protocol is being made by them is being followed. Now another thing which is a recent one has come up is that we know that in most of the tumors which are in the bone marrow, like multiple myeloma, plasma cells are there in the bone marrow. Now, what is the role of microenvironment? Because it is believed that it is a microenvironment which is affecting the plasma cells with the secretion of interleukin-6, interleukin-1, beta, and the microenvironment plays a great role in multiplication of the leukemic cells or in multiplication of the plasma cells. And now what has happened is that now we are able to find out the MRD in a particular case of multiple myeloma. So that means 
Now we have MRD positive and MRD negative multiple myeloma cases. Now the treatments are being designed in view of the MRD positivity or MRD negativity. And of course, taking into account the various uh, mutations which are occurring in these cases of multiple myeloma. Now I go on to another uh, totally uh, different subject and uh, that is uh, the coronary artery disease. We all know that uh, uh, these are the cases where the stents are being placed, surgery is being carried out, and uh, what they give are two drugs, two group of drugs, anticoagulants like heparin, warfarin, and second are the antiplatelet drugs. Because initially what was happening was that these uh, uh, antiplated drugs were not available and so therefore there used to be uh, uh, thrombus formation or uh, re-thrombus formation used to occur. So now with these antiplatelet drugs, aspirin, of course aspirin we came to know in 80s that uh, aspirin is an antiplated drug and then came uh, clodripogel, then came ticlodipidine and now we have got ticagrelor. Now, how do they differ? Now, aspirin affects the cyclooxygenase of the platelets. This ticlopidine and clodripogel, they act the ADP. And then ticagrelor is uh, GP2B3A antagonist. Now, this drug, the last one, is in use now because it causes reversible action on the platelets, unlike aspirin and ticlopidine, which is an irreversible action. And one of the side effects of all such patients who are taking these so-called blood thinners is that if bleeding starts, bleeding does not, bleeding starts, it does not stop uh, because of uh, you have to apply pressure and so on. But it is a problem in these cases. So Tika Grilor may be that we are able to find an answer uh, to all these problems. And then low molecular weight heparin is very, very useful now because heparin would cause uh, severe uh, skin necrosis in some of the cases. Though, so the side effects have been uh, diminished and it is injected subcutaneously. Now, what is happening in gene therapy? Now, gene therapy is that we replace a disease-causing gene or we inactivate a gene which is causing the disease and uh, lastly sometimes we introduce a new or a modified gene. Now this gene therapy has not taken off very well in last uh, 30 years except for the fact that recently the treatment for beta thalassemia patients who are receiving multiple transfusions they have uh, FDA has given permission for a curative gene therapy and that is the Betty cell. Immunotherapy in blood cancers. Now, uh, <clears throat> uh, I know a friend of ours who had pharyngeal carcinoma extending onto the tongue and uh, then widespread metastasis. He had undergone chemotherapy, underwent radiotherapy, but uh, no, it, you, it spread like anything. It was a very anaplastic tumor. And uh, then I think once chemo radio were over, then they offered him lymphocytes. They said that we'll inject your own lymphocytes and this is going to help you. Unfortunately, uh, that did not happen. He took those lymphocytes for uh, uh, about 12 weeks, but the disease de de deteriorated and uh, he expired. But now it appears that uh, after the treatment for metastatic melanoma in USA, uh, we have come a long way now and uh, probably the role of uh, uh, gene sequencing has also helped us. We know the human genome and uh, an effort is being made to study the genome of uh, various uh, malignancies. And in this, the CAR T-cell therapy has uh, been found to be quite uh, effective. Now, what is CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptors. 
Now, what we are doing in this is it is a CAR T cell therapy. That means we take the patient's <clears throat> T cells, modify them, create chimeric antigen receptors on those T cells. Excuse me. <clears throat> Recently, on Friday, February 16, there was an article on uh, CAR T cell therapy. Now, probably it is a new frontier in cancer care. It is something like uh, what we had uh, magic bullets of imatinib and CML. Now, this is a four-step disease. First is patients' T cells are taken. They are modified. They are modified by introducing a gene. That gene leads to production of chimeric antigen receptor. That antigen receptor comes and lies on the T cells. Now that is where, and then these bioengineered T cells are made to proliferate so that we have got large number of millions of uh, these bioengineered T cells. Then these engineered T cells are injected into the person. And once you inject into the person, we have made that receptor for cancer cells. So the cancer, these cells go and combine with the cancer cells and kill them. Now, that is the basis of CAR T cells. Actually, it started with uh, multiple myeloma, one of the first disease which was tackled because um, of the fact that uh, multiple myeloma could not be cured. But now what has happened is that uh, we have uh, various other... Uh, but of course, it is not without side effects. There are serious side effects also. But now it is being used for multiple myeloma and various other B-cell lymphomas, including acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Then I go to the minor part of advances in lab technology in last 50 years. And uh, one of them is liquid biopsy. Now, liquid biopsy is non-invasive alternative to doing biopsies. And here the usually blood is taken, and then we look for biomarkers. Now, actually, liquid biopsies also started about 10 years back, but only recently, in last two, three years, from the time we came to know about the genes of various cancers, it has been uh, really useful. We take the blood samples in the hope that there are circulating, number one, either tumor cells, or there are fragments of DNA or fragments of RNA. And then if we can isolate them and show that those are belonging to the tumor, because that will indicate us that what is the prognosis of the patient post chemotherapy or at times in suspected cancers where we don't know where the primary is, we can take the, these blood samples and look for uh, these uh, various alterations in the genes and in the DNA in various malignancies. Now the short uh, half-life and therefore we have to take the sample and process it uh, quickly and to characterize and monitor a cancer. Now this is also being used a process of nucleic acid amplification like we are using it for infectious diseases diagnosis. Now it is being also used for uh, liquid biopsies for nucleic acid amplification. Now, medical lab advancements have taken place all over the world in these last 50 years. Initially, it was that all these tests which were being carried out were laborious for the technicians. So the effort was made to bring in automation. And now we find automation in clinical chemistry, automation we find in, uh, in hematology, and we find it in histopathology. All over the automation has taken place. And the various, uh, it has reduced the cost. It has reduced the turnaround time. Similarly, in automated cell counters, now we have all the uh, parameters available like reticulocyte count, platelet count, and these are the accurate ones which are available. Now, the recent change has been 
earlier the markers of septicemia used to be banned cells banned forms of uh, neutrophils if we can find in the blood we would say that uh, this is a case of bandemia and especially in pediatric population in diarrheas they won't give a antibiotic till it is proved that the child is suffering from a bacterial diarrhea so the sepsis indicator is very very important because we can save the life of a patient before the patient goes into a, a cytokine storm and now we know that the earliest change which is occurring in the blood is in monocytes the neutrophils or the band forms come later on the monocyte shape changes their size changes with the result that mdw or monocyte uh, width is more than 20 and that is diagnostic of uh, uh, septicemia or septicemia is likely to occur in the next 12 hours now the various cell counters have come up from various companies but the fact remains all of them have monocyte more than mdw of more than 20 which is diagnostic for septicemia and of course all other things in these cell counters what they have made is that uh, everything the reports are available roughly within one minute or within two minutes and large loads of the samples can be processed similarly flow cytometry all of us are using for various diagnosis of lymphomas leukemias and uh, also for hla typing but what is a new thing which has come up is that we should not be adding uh, solutions for sample preparation we should not be that is the min idea is to minimize the unwanted effects which are caused by the sample preparation so that erythrolytic solutions may not be added washing steps may not be there so that it gives the cells as if they are in vivo and that has given a lot of information about the various cells viral dna detection actually it came or it was known because of the fact we all of us have gone through this covid 19 and uh, we found that unless the rna can be detected so once when the disease started it was a laborious procedure now the whole thing has been automated and the viral dna can be detected and that is where the nucleic acid amplification has also come so now we have rt pcr systems which are small and these are based on microfluidic devices that means here the reagents required are minimal number one number two the amount of the sample required is minimal maybe less than even a half a milliliter is good enough now this microfluidic technology has changed the concept and what we are now seeing is lab on a chip see like uh, nowadays what we find is uh, most of the cars are running on chips the various electrical system of the cars the engine starting engine stopping it is all based on a chip which is of course very very expensive but it is in each and every car similarly now lab on a chip is what we find that there are micro channels nano channels integration of multiple laboratory processes so the more automation is going to occur and more accurate results are going to come and these microchips are made on glass or ceramic depending upon where these are to be used now since microfluidic technology has come so the point of care testing has become easy because in point of care testing that is at the next to the bed it is something like blood sugar now you can do it you can wear a watch and it will give the uh, blood pressure findings it will transmit even uh, the ecg findings to your doctor similarly we can take the blood sample with a just prick and uh, then you can do the prothrombin time and the course or the disease the dose can be decided then and there so that this point of care coagulation system 
is now coming to various other parameters also. More and more parameters are being adjusted with this uh, technology. And lastly, a word about uh, genetic landscape that uh, in hematologic malignancies, whole exome sequencing is being carried out and it, it is taking a shape. And now we know the genetic character of various malignancies by analyzing the DNA, RNA. Earlier, it, the focus was on infectious diseases. And now what is it is a focus is on malignancies. Now this NGS has changed the concept. What we find is that each and every malignancy is being looked at not only with morphology, but also morphology, of course, is the first step in any malignancy for diagnosis. But the second step probably is NGS because uh, the genome makeup of these various tumors, analysis of the DNA and RNA gives a precise thing that this is what it is going to be. And accordingly, now personalized medicine is also coming in a big way. Like CAR T-cell therapy is a personal medicine because for each individual, his T-cells will be taken and then those will be re-injected. So similarly, various other malignancies also, probably we are going to have CAR T-cells or something more than CAR T-cells which are going to come up and that is going to happen. A word about digital pathology. I think now all of us know that uh, first uh, step in digital pathology is scanning. That you have to do scanning of a whole slide, which earlier used to take one to two hours. Now it takes only one to two minutes. And then these slides can be used for histology samples, histopathology, get high quality diagnostic images. So first thing is storage. Second thing is that we can send the images anywhere we want within seconds. And you can see that the meetings can be held. Uh, we can hold the conferences well, as we have done in COVID-19. Uh, so we have conducted two workshops on bone marrow refined biopsy with, uh, with this technology of digital pathology and the resistance were in their homes only. And it proved to be very, very uh, successful. So what do you think is going to be the next uh, big achievement in, um, in hematopathology or hematology? It is going to be two things. One is genomics and personalized medicine. These are going to evolve and have a greater impact on hematologic malignancies. And secondly, the potential of immunotherapy like CAR T cell has just uh, entered into a phase of development and we are sure that uh, it is going to be the next big achievement. So to conclude that uh, every day we find uh, medicine is progressing. We are having new drugs, we are having new technologies or the old technologies are being used in medicine now like blockchain and whatnot. And now a lot of emphasis is being placed on the data collection in various diseases, in various age groups. And probably a time is going to come that uh, as and when somebody has fever, you will call up the doctor. He already has your genetic makeup. He knows which are the abnormal genes, if at all. And he knows that these are the diseases you have already suffered. So probably he's going to give a medicine, personalized touch will be there, but of course, a lot of data is needed. So the rapid application of scientific observations to the diagnosis and management of hematologic disease is going to start and the things are going to be better for patients in due course of time. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for taking us through a very, very long and a very fascinating journey. I think uh, we really started, uh, uh, although not that bad, but uh, uh, 50 years we really helped. I just saw some, you know, what you mentioned in the in your uh, the, the presentation. You know, the first bone marrow transplant happened somewhere in uh, 1968, and by 2008 they have about eight lakh tra transplant. Yes, and then of course I'm sure by now I'm very sure if not at least the growth must be 
definitely about 15 lakh kind of numbers probably because oh, the yes. way it's exponentially grown up actually. It is about 2 million cases now. Yes. And success rate, I think probably what we're doing is, I think you also like I read somewhere very fascinating that, you know, we have a gene treatment, transplant, genetic treatment and, you know, editing. I think that's getting 90% success. I think this is something which is a science and evolution. Uh, we are really one, you know, like uh, uh, I think I was learning from me too because I think we're hearing, but I think very rightly said, monocytes uh, as a mother of septicemia. So, you know, I mean, the, as a MD student in pathology or after for a long tier time, we're just seeing they're just like a monocytes or something like you know, uh, recovery from uh, viral disorder, some kind of thing. But I think today they have played a very, very important role. So, that really shows that. Uh, however small numbers of the cells may be, little things matter. I think we should really focus on them in life in any case. I think those things. One important question is there for you in the box. I think we have a, you know, very quickly, we have a little time now, but I think we have a quick answer to that because um, what can be the tip for the young pathologist to pick up the diagnosis in early stage between rural and rural semi-urban areas? Because a lot of people come with late diagnosis, especially when it pathology. So anything, what are the, the tips for them, number one? And do we have some kind of algorithms today, uh, which is AI-based something we're developing, which probably help us out? So a quick uh, address to that, sir. We have a couple of minutes left. Uh, second question first, because uh, these uh, AI algorithms are in the process of making. See, in hematology, we find now the these artificial intelligence machines are able to pick up the changes in white cells as well as in various monocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, but it is limited to the peripheral blood. As far as the bone marrow is concerned, the work is limited because of the various fact that number one, the staining uh, quality is affected. Second thing, the disease, diseases are so many and hematology is one subject where you find in any time of, at any time, both normal and abnormal cells are present. Say, for example, if a patient has got 40% blast, then 60% are normal cells. It is unlike a growth in an area where you find it is hemangioendothelioma or it is a fibrosarcoma, but the rest of the tissue is normal. So that does not happen. Every point of time, you have T cells, B cells, which are normal. And then you have the B-cell lymphoma also. So artificial intelligence is coming not in a big way as of now, but maybe if we are able to give uh, thousands of various morphologies, which it is able to pick up, yes, then it is going to be really a very, very helpful area as far as this is concerned. And of course, the digital pathology See, this artificial intelligence is going to be useful only because of digital pathology. I think which you have been advocating for last five years that it has been, uh, it is going to come in a big way where uh, discussions can take place over uh, these. And secondly, in remote areas, if you just put the scanner, put the slide, sitting at daily, we can give the diagnosis. So... Patient does not have to send the slides which get broken on the way or whatever. So this, I think, digital pathology, it has got a place. And artificial intelligence combination is occurring because of digital pathology. I think that's a very pearls of wisdom for us. I think anybody, if at all, pathologists, younger ones, or of course, us also, like wherever you are, I think don't shy away from the technology. Techno use technology to your advantage because it's not like, you know, so I think uh, the combination of the technology going to improve our diagnosis, help us how to augment our intelligence. And probably I always say AI is not this uh, artificial intelligence, but it's basically awesome intelligence. Probably helps us out to something build up awesomely and probably help the diagnosis. Uh, sir, thank you so much for being here. I think uh, what uh, I think it's been a long time. Thank you for everybody. But I think I sort of close down and say like, you know, Meanwhile, as the field has evolved, the role of pathologist has also grown. I think it changed from a hematopathologist or histopathology curated with clinical diagnostician. And yes. finally, to a vital member of patient care team. I think it's very, very important. If I've learned rather from you, I've seen you working and I think every patient, every doctor you talk, I think for pathologist learning is we should become a part of the integrated part of the patient care team. Right. 
probably if you are part of the clinical team, the collaboration would help. Otherwise, things are because the way the technology is advanced. I think we will not be able to put together a good diagnosis. And nothing like a pathologist being there who can actually combine things together with very personalized precision diagnosis, and probably that can help the clinical friends to develop a very targeted therapies. Whether it's a, from the manufacturing point of view or a prescribing point of view, technologies, automation are there. We need to really adopt that. Uh, with this, I like to just come down to my closure before I hand over to Veena. I'll say a few words. Uh, I'd like you know, I tried some my hands on this. You know, like uh, you know, from uh, morphological whispers in the past, hematological journey, hematological journey is a vast. Cells under the lens were a visual quest. In the morphological era, knowledge was blessed. Immunological dawn started a paradigm shift. Stains and markers became a diagnostic gift. Antibodies here and there revealed the unseen. The immunological era brought in a vibrant sheen. Yes. Mid centuries gift stains and techniques divine. Immunohistoric chemistry, flow cytometry aligned. They were lightening the diagnosis, malignancies were exposed, a progress marked where knowledge was imposed. But with genomic embrace, science leaped. With more understanding of genetic strengths, the secrets got revealed. Molecular era is a symphony grand, unlocking the codes of a genetic strand. Artificial intelligence joined the hematological quest as data analyzed, accuracy is getting blessed. Pattern recognition, a dance with efficiency, AIs embrace a diagnostic proficiency. The clinicians and pathologists in a harmony convey unison they join as they pave the new way. It's a symphony of knowledge, a collaborative play. The metapathologists stride fast into a new day. Future whispers, a molecular song. Skills get refined and the knowledge gets grow strong. As precision steers, metapathology will fast grow fast through the years. Deeper insights that the future is called a metapathology journey is standing tall. I think this is something what we are here today and I think we all look forward probably we are blessed to have you here sir. I think as we stand the crossroad of technology and medicine, metapathology is a hope to a future and of course it's a lot of it's very fast for 10 years a lot of change very collaboration fueled by innovation with the unravel the mysteries of blood disorders offering hope and healing to every patient. Thank you so much for being here, sir. Thank you it's so much. Here. I think I'm yes. all the audience. Okay. And we look forward. Anybody have any questions, they can always write back to us. And I think we'll get back to you, whosoever is recording, we'll be available at some point of time. Yeah. And with this, thank you once again. And thank you, Veenaji. And thank we are you, looking yes. for the second webinar, uh, which will be, I think, uh, this, I think Veenaji just announced, it's on the peripheral, demystifying the peripheral Blood uh, smear, and that again by Honorable Sir Dr. Dehda Singh, sir. We look forward to see you all there. Thank you again. Back to Vinaji. Thank you, Dr. God. Thank you, Vina. Thank you it was so a pleasure much. to be here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for Thank giving you. us such a wonderful learning and recapitulating experience. It wasn't just educational, and I'm speaking from my heart. It was also inspirational as you made such complex concepts so easy to understand through the various. Uh, case studies that you shared with us. And of course, it was nostalgic as it took us back to our lecture theatres in our respective uh, colleges. Yes. <laughs> and it's really a privilege and honour to be a part of your class today, sir. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Dr. Gore, for moderating this session in your quintessential style and for the dose of medical poetry that you added. Oh, yes, that was great. <laughs> Beautiful. <And laughs> it was I, a great I can't poetry. thank you enough for all the support that you've extended. And lastly, and importantly, of course, thanks to all the attendees who showed up in very large numbers uh, to join us in this learning experience. And I would like to add here that please do join us uh, on the 3rd of April, 2024, between 3 to 4 p.m. for another lecture on peripheral blood demystified. I think it is a very intriguing topic and uh, we promise that Sir, the Guru himself will make it simple to understand. So we look forward to seeing you all and thank you once again, Sir. And thanks a lot, Dr. Gaur. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Stay happy, healthy. And uh, thank you. The next thank you. Thank you.